The next uh, item is AB 1134, item number 25. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'll begin as uh, witnesses show up. AB 1134 is about symmetry, really. And currently, when issuing concealed carry weapons permits, the, generally it is the county sheriffs that do that, and in some instances, potentially a, a police chief in a city. And if there is an arrangement or a situation where a police chief wants to be able to because they have better understanding of their community than the sheriff, what 1134 would allow would be the sheriff and the police chief to enter into agreement, this is a voluntary bill, to allow then the police chief to be issuing CCW permits instead of the sheriff in that case. The, this comes in following a case that came out of Southern California, the LA area, where the courts didn't quite seem to understand that relationship and turned it around when the county sheriff was trying to allow, I believe it was the city of Los Angeles, police chief to be able to issue CCW permits. So again, this is voluntary. It, it allows that relationship to be developed between the county sheriff and a particular city police chief. It's fairly straightforward. The Sheriff's Association brought this to me and, and asked me to carry this bill, which I'm very happy to do to uh, provide some clarity in this area. And with that, I have a couple of witnesses in support and respectfully ask for your eye votes. All right, two witnesses, two minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Aaron McGuire on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association. We are the sponsors of this legislation and co-sponsoring along with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, yeah, this comes out of an issue about uh, the authority of the sheriff to basically ask that an applicant go to their police chief first in the city that they reside and seek that CCW from, from them. Uh, the intent of this legislation is not to limit the avail availability of CCW permits. It's simply a mechanism to allow uh, which agency might be in a better posture to make those determinations of good moral character. Uh, and with that, we ask for your I vote. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Lieutenant Wayne Billow, and on behalf of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, for the above stated reasons, we support the bill and urge your support. Thank you. Very good. Um, other witnesses in support, uh, name, organization, and position. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members. Sean Rundle with the California Peace Officers Association in support. Okay. Uh, witness, <coughs> any other witnesses in support? Then witnesses in opposition. Uh, yes, please have a seat, and uh, you have uh, uh, two minutes. Mr. Chair, members, Craig Deleuze with the Firearms Policy Coalition, the California Association of Federal Firearms Licensees. Um, AB 1134 basically overturns 40 years of precedent. Uh, share it, in this precedent is that sheriffs have the ministerial responsibility uh, duty, in fact, to administer the CCW or the concealed weapons carry process. Uh, the court case that was referenced wasn't, it, it wasn't a case where they, they didn't get it. What they understood was that this ministerial responsibility was there for the sheriffs because they are duly elected by the people. In fact, what it stated was that they cannot abdicate that duty. It also stated that applicants could not be required to jump through uh, additional unnecessary hoops, as was the case uh, in this particular case where you had to be turned down by your local municipality before you could go to the sheriff's office to apply. The fact is, is the reason why this is in the hands of our sheriffs is because they are, elect they are elected and thus uh, duly responsible or uh, specifically to the people. What this does is it takes it out of their hands. They abdicate that responsibility and send it to, for all due, you know, all due respect, to an appointed bureaucrat who is not necessarily duly elected, who is not necessarily uh, uh, accountable to the people. The final concern, and probably the biggest concern that we have in this particular case, is the fact that the, the way in which the bill is worded you could require someone who is an administrator who's a police chief in a jurisdiction to which you are not a resident, you will have to then go and apply to them. So for example, I'm a resident of the city of Sacramento. I could have to go to the city of Galt and apply in the city of Galt. I have no real accountability on top of the fact that I have to drive literally half the county away in order to be there. You know, our concern is that this is just, this is primarily a due process issue. 
Um, and I would encourage you to look at the language of the bill, and I, I think that you'll find that that is specifically the case. We already have 52 elected sheriffs. We have 52 different processes. Do we really want to create an additional patchwork by now including uh, cities and municipalities in this? It's for these and many reasons uh, that we oppose this measure. All right, additional witnesses in opposition? Okay, um, I'm going to have a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Mr. Lackey. I was just going to make comment that uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the remarks against this particular bill are very, very difficult for me to understand, and the fact that it does seem like it, it, it creates a, a greater burden on those who are seeking uh, this type of uh, benefit that I believe is protected by the Second Amendment, and I believe it also creates less accountability, so I'll have trouble supporting this thing. All right. Uh, other comments from members? Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, would it be true? And if, well, let me just make a comment. If what he said about Sacramento people having to go to Galt, that particular thing, perhaps you could uh, respond to that in your close. Uh, and any of the other uh, items that you have uh, with regard to uh, the opposition right. in terms of the burden being higher. Thank you. Then I'll close and take that opportunity. There's no additional burden. This would allow a sheriff to reach an agreement with a local police chief, and then that police chief who knows their constituents better, knows the, 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 the citizens in that city much better, in a better position to address moral character, it would not then be a duplicative layer where the city and then the county are going to have to weigh in. This is merely giving the, the police chief in that city the ability to issue the CCW permit. And the bill, as I read it, was not intended to allow a situation where a sheriff would enter into, as the example prescribed, an agreement with the police chief in Galt, for example, and then all of the citizens of Sacramento be forced to go down to Galt. Um, and that is, in, in if that's something in there, I'm happy to try and amend it to make sure that that situation doesn't happen, because that is directly antithetical to what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to give the police chief, the sheriff, the person who has the most experience with that individual who's applying for a CCW to then be able to weigh in on it. So I, I, I respectfully disagree that we're creating any additional hurdles, and if there is a thought that a sheriff would, and I don't know why a sheriff would, give a second city the ability to give CCWs for a first city in that circumstance, that, that just doesn't make any sense. And, and I can't imagine why that situation would come up. And I don't know why a sheriff would do that, but happy to clarify that in the bill as it okay. moves forward. Um, one other question. Uh, in this um, bill, um, it was mentioned that in the case of the city of L.A., if the L.A. police chief were to turn it down, they could appeal to the sheriff. Would that be part of this? Excuse me. This was the case uh, earlier in the uh, uh, court case that came up. Uh, is that the case with this bill, or would the chief have the final say? No, this would be giving the chief the ability to say yes or no, because they're the ones that have a most direct relationship with the citizens of that city. Okay, so there wouldn't be an appeal. Correct. All right. Um, so I'm recommending an aye uh, for the reason stated by the author uh, that the police chief would know best. Also, um, certainly in a the, in the county the size of L.A., um, I think it's very hard for a sheriff with a committee of, with a county of millions and millions of people um, to make that determination. So I think particularly in that case it's relevant. Um, so I, I think that this could actually make it easier to get a concealed carry. Um, so it could make it, you know, and again, the sheriff has the discretion. If he gives his discretion to the chief and he doesn't like what's happening, can he take it back? That would be between the two parties to arrange how that would happen. All right. Um, again, I, uh, I trust the chiefs and the sheriffs that they've come to a good agreement, so I'm recommending an I vote. Uh, the motion is, is a motion? oh, is there a motion? The motion to move the bill. All right. So thank you, uh, Mr. Jones-Sawyer. I will second. Um, we will then, uh, what is the motion? 
Do pass to the floor. Do pass to the floor. Uh, Madam Secretary, you may call the roll. Quirk. Aye. Quirk, aye. Melendez? Melendez, no. Gonzalez? Joan Sawyer? Joan Sawyer, aye. Lackey? No. Lackey, no. Lowe? Santiago? The bill's on call. The bill is on call. We will keep things open. Do we have any more bill? Oh, my bill comes up next. We will keep bill, the bill open and make sure that we get uh, uh, the other committee members to weigh in. Mr. Jones Sawyer, you have some bills. Yes, lots of them. Three bills. Uh, Mr. Jones Sawyer, which bill would you like to take up first? I will, I will take them in numerical order, starting with AB 672, the inmate reentry assistance. All right, that's uh, item number 14, AB 672. Okay. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, AB 672 requires CDCR to provide transitional services to wrongfully convicted in individuals upon their release from prison. Over the last two decades, the number of exonerated in the United States has nearly tripled every year. After spending decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit, wrongfully committed, convicted persons are released back into the community without access to basic transitional services such as housing assistance, job training, or drug rehabilitation. Simply put, this bill will provide access to the same services that parolees are able to receive upon release from custody. Here today to testify in support is Obi Anthony and Ignacio Hernandez, who is representing the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice. In 2011, Mr. Anthony, after being wrongfully commit, com convicted, was released from detention after spending 17 years in prison. Mr. Anthony, Anthony was the inspiration of this bill. He was released from prison with nothing but his clothes and a few dollars in his pocket. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Mr. Anthony. All right, two witnesses, uh, two minutes each. Um, thank you, Chairman and Vice Chairman, for the opportunity to be able to speak here today to testify. Uh, perhaps you could, you're soft spoken, uh, if you could move you. this uh, a little closer uh, and speak a little louder. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be Much able better. to be able to speak uh, in support of the bill. As Mr. Sawyer has spoken, um, I was tried and convicted of a murder robbery back in 1995. I was sentenced to the term of life without the possibility of parole, and upon that sentence, I spent 17 years in, incarcerated. Um, it was in 2011 that I was finally exonerated by the help of the Northern Innocent Project in Loyola, Maryland, that procured my freedom. However, walking, upon, walking out of the door, um, after the judge exonerated me, I walked out of the door to a vastness of darkness, of nothing. I had no support in regards to medical. I had no opportunity to get proper identification. I had no assistance with housing, nor did I have anything or direction, in other words, or what to do. I had missed 17 years of my life. Uh, at that point, Google had came out, the internet was involved, and I had no knowledge at that junction of how to utilize those things or any assistance to be able to help me to do that. So I'm here today and ask for your I vote in support of the bill because how the tremendous of work and the help that it'll do. And I will say that your great strength of character is shown by your ability to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next witness. Thank you, Ignacio Hernandez. On behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, we are the sponsor uh, of this bill. I want to thank Mr. Anthony for sharing with us his story. Uh, we worked with him last year on a bill dealing with prosecutorial misconduct. And during our discussions, he raised with us just the challenges that he had when he was released from prison. Uh, prosecutorial misconduct was a part of, of, his, uh, of his case and one of the reasons why he was later exonerated. Uh, really just want to be available for technical questions. I know that um, we are looking, uh, we'll move forward. And, well, I'll leave it at that right now. I believe there will probably be some questions and I can go ahead and uh, answer those for the committee. Very good. Um, witnesses have been brief. Uh, you can take a minute if you'd like. Well, I think the bill stands on its own merits. It makes complete sense. It's unfathomable the amount of injustice that have been done to these individuals. And uh, Matt Gray, on behalf of Taxpayers for Improving Public Safety, asks and urges your support. Thank you. Uh, other witnesses in support? So name, organization, and position. Bobby Walker on behalf of California Public Defenders Association in strong support. Thank you. 
Micah Doktoroff, ACLU of California, and proud support. Raji Prasad, National Association of Social Workers, and we also support this. David Bouchot on behalf of Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, and we also support. Tim Yorian on behalf of the Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, the Los Angeles Police Pr Protective League, the uh, Riverside Sheriffs Association, Los Angeles Probation Officers, ask me Local 685, the California College and University uh, Police Chiefs, and the California Correctional Supervisors. This is the right thing to do. We support the bill. Very good. Any further witnesses? Um, questions from members? So this is uh, the uh, Jones Sawyer AB 672 um, wrongful convictions and support as people get out. Uh, any uh, comments? Mr. Lackey? Yeah, I just know that uh, there was a, an, a technical amendment that we had uh, discussed clarifying the eligibility for ID cards. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, that was still in order. Yeah, I, uh, Ignacio Hernandez, if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, respond to that. We will uh, be working on that going forward. I think there was a, a question as to eligibility for the ID cards. Uh, and so that's something we're going to talk to both the Depart CDCR and also DMV uh, to identify. One of the challenges that under current law that was uh, uh, passed just a I believe last year, year before, and funded parolees uh, do have access to identif identification card when they're released. One of the challenges is that there's a limit uh, that they have to have a photo that's no more than 10 years old on file with DMV. Someone like Mr. Anthony, who's been wrongfully convicted, it surpasses that that 10 year threshold. So we need to find a way uh, to address that. But we also want to make clear that they would otherwise be eligible for a state identification card. We simply want to to restore them to where they were before they were wrongfully incarcerated. So we will be looking at that technical issue going forward and trying to get it right with CDCR and DMV. That's my only impediment. Thank you. Uh, very good. Thank you for that comment, Mr. Lackey. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick comment, if I may. Um, I can't. I can't imagine having 17 years or 30 years or two years of your life um, taken away wrongfully and then being released and saying, we're very sorry, we made a mistake, good luck. Um, that just seems unreasonable to me. So I'm happy to support your bill, Mr. Uh, Joan Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Motion. All right. What, uh, we need a motion. Thank you. Uh, so moved by Member Gonzalez. Uh, Seconded by a vice chair. Um, the motion is passed to appropriations, and I know you'll be working with, on uh, Mr. Lackey's concern. Um, Madam Secretary, you may call the roll. Quirk? Aye. Quirk? Aye. Melendez? Melendez? Aye. Gonzalez? Gonzalez? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Lackey? Aye. Lackey? Aye. Low? Aye. Low? Aye. Santiago? All right, it's, the bill is out. I know I didn't give you a chance to close, but you didn't seem to need it. No, I respectfully after you, I vote. <laughs> oh, well, I'll get this right. So your next bill is AB 696, number 16. AB 696, probable cause determination hearings. Uh, Good morning or good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Before I begin, I want to thank the committee uh, staff for their thoughtful analysis and for their patience in working with my staff on this bill. Under current law, um, Ms. Meant uh, in custody is entitled to a ruling at the time of his or her arraignment by a magistrate to determine whether there is probable cause to believe that an offense was committed by the defendant. Misdemeanor defendants who are out of custody, however, are in, in a uniquely disadvantageous position in the judicial system because they are not afforded the same opportunity for a prompt probable cause determination before an impartial magistrate, leaving them susceptible to meritless and unsupported charges. AB 696 would amend Penal Code 991 to allow courts to make probable cause determination for both out of custody as well as in custody misdemeanor defendants, but will not require determination to be made at arraignment. Under Penal Code 10054, both the defense and prosecuting institutions must provide discovery of their evidence to the other side 30 days before trial. 
Under this bill, the probable cause determination will not be at the point that the prosecution provides all of its evidence to the defense. Determination will be based on all of that evidence as long as it meets the minimum test of reliability. The opposition claims that there is hardship to out of there is no hardship to out of custody misdemeanor defendants who cannot promptly obtain a probable cause determination simply because they are not confined. I would argue that the hardship is having a charge hanging over your head that is wholly unsubstantiated with no recourse towards obtaining a speedy resolution from an impartial magistrate. This bill also does not require the filing of written motions or the calling of witnesses, which reduces their workload. In fact, this bill would even benefit prosecutors by allowing them more time to, gar to gather and present evidence to support their claims of probable cause. As the number of misdemeanor cases increases with the passing of Prop 47, and with judicial resources continuing to shrink, the judiciary itself has a vested interest in screening out a screening out of custody misdemeanor cases before they become an unnecessary burden on his trial on his trial courts. AB 696 is a long overdue fix to our legal mechanism for identifying and weeding out weak and baseless cases at an early age for, for the benefit of both the court system and the litigants. It is an expensive and streamlined alternative. It's an inexpensive and streamlined alternative that, that should benefit, um, pay dividends, and save time, stress, and resources for all resolved. Here to testify today is Jose Verlera, Public Defender for the Office of Mayor and County. Good morning, Chair, members. I want to thank you for this opportunity to be here to discuss six, uh, uh, AB 696. I have worked in several counties, San Diego, Los Angeles, and all that time I've been a public defender. Today I represent the California Public Defenders Association. Uh, the Assembly uh, member has really spoken well about the need for this bill. One of the things that most people don't understand is the difference between no crime and misdemeanor is often a shade of subjectivity and often a dif difficult one. And to be able to have the access to justice for out-of-custody defendants to be able to present their case through their attorney to a judge to make an assessment of probable cause is something that reignites the ability to, to know that they have uh, access to justice, but more than that, they're able to get quick resolutions to their cases. What most people don't understand with regard to misdemeanors is that many of the misdemeanor clients are out of custody because they have jobs, they have responsibilities, they have all of those things, and their entryway into the criminal justice system puts all of that at risk. The sooner we can get people out of the criminal justice system when they are, should not be there because of cases that involve oftentimes uh, inexperienced officers writing a ticket, uh, inexperienced officers uh, on the street uh, charge, having people charged uh, with crimes. The difficult part is that oftentimes uh, people will plead guilty just to get out of the system. And the collateral consequences of a misdemeanor conviction are incredible. Many families have gone through uh, trying to clean up records, but in the end, it's a very difficult thing. This bill gives people the chance, when there is no case, to have their life back sooner rather than later. I will say that as an ancillary, I have been asked by judges, why are we doing so many misdemeanor cases? And then we win those cases. And the cost to the taxpayers and the judiciary of taking up courtroom time on a misdemeanor that really had no value is really something that people should be very concerned about. So thank you much, very much for your time. I ask for an aye vote on this bill. Thank you. Uh, next witness. Philip Osagai, also on behalf of CPDA, we are the sponsor of this legislation. Urge an aye vote. All right. Other witnesses in support? Dennis Garcia on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice in support. Micah Doctoroff on behalf of the ACLU of California in support. David Bouchot on behalf of Legal Services for Prisoners with Children in support. Any other witnesses in support? Okay, witnesses in opposition. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Member Sean Hoffman with the California District Attorneys Association. Uh, we have concerns about trial court resources being consumed with these new hearings. Uh, certainly in the case of an in-custody defendant, there are liberty issues at stake, and that's why Section 991 exists, to provide uh, the defendant with a, a prompt determination of probable cause to satisfy his Fourth Amendment right. The situation with out-of-custody defendants we see as being a little bit different because those that deprivation of liberty isn't there. Um, you know, certainly as, 
as the author said, there are there are other issues associated with having that having that charge out there, but uh, we we don't see the two the two categories of, of defendants as being analogous. Um, <clears throat> additionally, we have a little bit of a technical concern with the way this is drafted right now. Uh, a 991 determination happens upon the motion of the defendant or defense counsel. Um, 696 would make the default that there would be a hearing unless they opt out. So it's kind of an opt in if you're in custody and an opt out if you're out of custody, which if the idea is that we're going to have, we're going to save money by you know, reducing the number. I think in the analysis it talked about you know, a, a couple more determination hearings for out of custody defendants. The way that it's set up, it would be an out of cust it would be a determination hearing for every single one of them unless they opt out, um, which is the opposite of the way that it works. So I think that's uh, something that we would like to see fixed. I don't think it re resolves all of our issues, but certainly a big one in terms of uh, trial court resources. Thank you. Very good. Additional witnesses in opposition. All right. Uh, comments and questions from the members. Mr. Lackey. How'd you know I had something to say? Well, you reached for the button. Oh, okay. You do this. this I, 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 I read minds. <laughs> I thought maybe it was my tie or something. I didn't, anyways. Um, no, I think that there's some, uh, this is a tough one for me. Um, quite frankly, I think that the, uh, you're on the right track and, and, and I, I, I applaud you for what you're trying to accomplish here. And I, I have a little bit of a struggle on, you know, some of the remarks that have been made to try to discount the power of misdemeanors. I uh, spent a profession focusing on a very, very meaningful misdemeanor, that being of driving under the influence of alcohol. Uh, so this is a very serious offense, and uh, it can be. So misdemeanors uh, carry very, very significant weight. And so I think the decision we make here is one that uh, will impact our court system substantially. So I, I just hope that we're balancing the concerns that the DA has, has indicated as well as uh, what's in the, the best interest of justice. And uh, I'm struggling with this one. I'm not sure whether I'm yay or nay, but I'm, I'm getting close. All right. Um, other comments or questions? Uh, so in your close, um, we have the DA's concern it takes more court time. Your witness and support takes less. I note that we haven't heard from the Judicial Council who might give us an independent, but the fact that they haven't been here indicates at least it's not on the top of their items at the moment. Uh, anyway, if you could uh, address that in your close. Okay, and, and as the, obviously, as the chair of Budget Sub 5, if there is additional costs, I'm, I'm probably the one that's going to have to deal with it immediately um, if there's additional costs. So I am very concerned whether or not this will cause um, additional resources. The re one of the reasons I wanted to do this because I firmly believe that in, over the long haul it will reduce the amount of time that we have to deal with adjudicating these misdemeanors. Um, and so um, from that perspective, I want to move forward with it. Um, obviously, if, if, if we have unintended consequences where it does cause some uh, additional costs to the courts, um, I, will, I will personally deal with it um, after that and, and ensure that, that we if we have to come back and make any type of adjustment, um, we'll do that. But I will guarantee you before we get to that, we'll have a long and deep discussion um, with the opponents of the bill um, to really go through what their concerns are. Sometimes it's a matter of semantics, because I'm not, I can't address it, because I'm not, I can't feel it, see it, touch it right now, um, their concerns, but I'm open to, to hearing from them, and I guarantee you if this moves forward from this committee, that by the time it reaches the floor, um, we'll have clarity on, on how um, I plan to address the, the, the financial issues. All right. Uh, given that excellent close, and uh, I, uh, my belief that this would give us more due process, um, less concerns with people having to clean up records, and the knowledge that we will deal with the workload issue, which you are uh, which you have to deal with in Budget Sub 5. Uh, I enthusiastically uh, recommend an I vote to move this along. And, uh, and I have the uh, word of the author and the opposition, that, and I know the opposition well, and I know that they work well uh, with our authors. So uh, again, it, uh, recommend an I vote, and the motion is? Do you pass? Do we have a motion? Uh, let's get a motion um, from a member. 
All right. So I think that was moved by Evan Lowe. Yes, Mem oh, excuse me. Member Santiago, seconded by Member Gonzalez. Um, and the motion is do pass to the floor. Um, let's see. So, Madam Secretary, uh, you may call the roll. Quirk? Aye. Quirk? Aye. Melendez? Melendez not voting. Gonzalez? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Lackey? Based on the close, I'll go with aye. Lackey? Aye. Low? Aye. Low? Aye. Santiago? Aye. Santiago? Aye. The bill is out with a vote of 6-0. And uh, thank you very much.